I'd like to welcome you back to, this is uh, part 5 of this uh, teaching, uh, pre-tribulation rapture versus post-tribulation rapture, and um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement that uh, what I'm going to be doing is um, I'm going to be taking all these videos that I've made and I'm going to be putting them in an audio format, and uh, I'm going to probably put them on CDs, so if anybody would be interested in uh, giving them out to people or whatever, um, you can go ahead and contact me in a private message. And this is regarding any teachings I do, the Armor of God series that I did, um, things of that nature. So you can share them with your uh, your pastor or your churches. I didn't even know they probably won't want, want to hear a lot of the things that has to be said, but... Um, um, but that's the, but that's the whole purpose is to hopefully open the eyes to those that are blind, so that they can see. Um, for as Revelations, I think chapter three, talking about the uh, Church of Laodicea, where he says, you know, purchase eye salve so that you, you can see, um, and um, I think that'll be. A nice way to do that um, after this series is done I'm gonna do this is probably gonna take one video and this is for basically the young believers um, that might be questioning questioning things um, I'm gonna be doing a salvation teaching um, it's, it, sh it should be too long I mean it's very simple to comprehend um, you know and you know, but always keep in mind that that is just the beginning you have a long way to go okay you just don't stop at uh, receiving the gift of salvation okay um, but uh, so I'm gonna be doing that and I also got another one coming up uh, dealing with uh, the true meaning of Romans 13 we know how the 501c3 and the churches and the government saying oh you have to obey government because that's what Romans 13 says and we're gonna be looking deep in that too here in the near future um, and also I opened up a Zipcast account um, and I'm also gonna be sharing my stuff on there too so um, let me know go ahead and send me a private message um, and uh, if any of you guys would be interested in uh, getting these put on CD formats or whatever I will be doing that and um, so you can uh, share them because it's a lot easier to put them on a, a mp3 or a CD type format than it is DVD so because um, I got a sound recorder and all I have to do is just record the sound of my voice onto the mp3 files and just uh, put them on a CD basically so um, so that's that. Um, well, we are we are done with the history. Okay, and now we are going to get into the good stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know how many more videos this is going to take. It might take two, possibly three more, because there is so much scripture that I want to give you, and uh, just so much. Um, and uh, you have to uh, really be honest with yourselves, okay? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I don't care what your parents might have told you. I don't care what your pastors might have told you. I don't care what anybody has told you. As I said in the beginning of this series, if all you had was your King James Bible, if all you had was the scriptures, and you didn't have any books, and you didn't have any recollection of anything, what conclusion would you come to regarding the rapture? Okay. Um, throughout all the Chuck Mislers, throughout all the Hagees or the um, um, Tim LaHaye's, the um, Hal Lindsey's, throw them all out. The Jack Van Impey's. Don't even consider them. What does the scripture say? Without 
man's interpretation of it. Okay? That's the point is I'm trying to make here. Okay? And regarding 501c3, I just mentioned that. See, this is the thing. Okay? There is a thing that's listed that even if you talk about the second coming of Christ, you can be labeled as, as a terrorist. And that includes both pre- and post-trib. Okay? Believers. You know? Um... Again, I just want to emphasize that this is not a salvation issue. However, if your faith is being totally put uh, of you getting out of here before all the bad stuff happens and it doesn't go down the way you thought it would, there's a good possibility that you will be offended and then you would be the ones that um, betray your family, your fellow brethren, and everything to have them delivered up, you know, because you'll encounter scoffing and mocking and stuff like that. And that would be the, be a main catalyst for the falling away, okay? <clears throat> so that is really what I'm trying to emphasize here, and I am not... You know, I'm not attacking any individuals. Again, what I'm going after is the doctrine, okay? I'm going after the specific doctrine, okay? Um, and as we go further into the scriptures, I am going to be addressing the issues that um, pre-trib believers have, you know, with their questions and everything like that. You know, the main ones, the main ones you hear all the time. The church is not mentioned after Revelation 3, Revelation 3.10, um, we're going to go into that. And I touched on Revelation 3.10 very briefly. And see, again, the thing is, 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 is with pre-trib, okay, we take like one verse without, you know, possibly reading further down in that same chapter. Or, and we just take one verse and we just make a doctrine out of it. That's wrong. That's one of the main things that's wrong with these churches today. And that's one of the main things why the church is in so much sin. Okay. <clears throat> um, the 501c3 thing is another thing. They, they made the government their God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So there, you know, that's another state of sin. Okay, abortion is another one, homosexual is another one, all that kind of stuff. But um, that's, that's besides the point I'm going down the rabbit trail there. But uh, you just got to ask yourself these things. Okay, to seek the truth from God, we must be totally honest with ourselves. Okay. Our Lord, King of Kings, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. He also said that when the Holy Spirit came, he will lead us into all truth. If we are truly disciples of Christ, we must accept all truth no matter where it leads. No matter if it's going to offend you. <clears throat> no matter if it's going to hurt. No matter if it's going to sting. If it's, what, if it's what the scriptures say, then it's what it says. All right. So, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is what builds up your faith. The Word of God is what um, strengthens you, okay, to endure for the times of head. You know, times ahead. He who endures till the end shall be saved, okay. Um, John 8.31 says, Then said Jesus to the Jew, to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Sanctify thee through thy word, thy word is truth. Okay, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, was God, and the word was with God. Okay. Uh, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he sees. Um... And, and when I apply that verse to myself, I see a huge mass of deception going on. And I see a huge portion of the church, of the body, um, just totally putting their full faith in this doctrine. Okay. And that is what can be very, very dangerous. 
okay? We are not supposed to put faith in man's doctrine, okay? We are supposed to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone, okay? Um, the faith pleases God. And uh, if we don't have any faith, how are we going to be able to endure the persecutions to come? Okay, you have to ask yourself that question. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, it you know, this doctrine may seem right to you, okay, with, with all the scriptures you, you take out here and there. It might seem right. It might make sense to you. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 17, 16, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he has no heart to it? Heart to it. A fool has no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. So you really have to really ask yourself these things. Do you truly delight in understanding, or do, you, or do you just want to throw everything out that anybody might be saying to you to say, hey, you might want to look at this, and then you just totally throw it out the window? If that's so, Proverbs 18.2 could very well be applying to you. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be del he shall be delivered. Okay. Jeremiah seventeen five. Thus saith the Lord: Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord, for he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. <clears throat> See, if you're trusting in your, in your in your own heart, that's a sense of pride. Okay, if you're trusting in your own heart, you know where, um, you know you you think you have it right, you can do no wrong, you uh, can soak in all the TV you want, you can you can do whatever you want, and you can do no wrong. Well, again, he that trusts in his own heart is a fool. So if that might be you, then you are under the classifications of a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. That's what the Bible says. I'm not saying it. I mean, if, you, if you're going to... I mean, your argument is not with me, it's with the Word of God. So, um, before we really get started in the Scriptures, I want to give you a story of martyrdom. Now, this is a very touching story, okay? And, and this really is another thing that that plays true in, in the days that are coming, okay, because we have to have this kind of faith, okay, Pastor, F I mean, Pastor Falescu and his son, an extraordinary story of Christian persecution, if we don't have this kind of faith, because we have so, been so pampered and watered down here in America, we don't know, I don't know what it's going to be like, you know, um, that is why our faith has to, have to be grounded in the Word of God, the solid rock, okay? We have to have that. If we don't, and when persecution comes, regardless if it's your kid, and now this is going to be very... Now, I want you to think. I want you to think after you read this story. Put yourself in the mind... Put yourself in this situation right here. And you seriously tell me right now, at this very moment, if this was happening to you right now, search your heart, judge yourself, okay? You need to judge yourself. If this was to happen to you right now, what would you do? Especially if you have your full faith in this rapture doctrine. What would you do? Especially when it comes to the mark of the beast. Okay. Pastor Florescu and his son, an extraordinary story of Christian persecution. See, I have a very, um, I have a very, uh, 
strong heart. I, I, I have a very strong compassion with these martyrs. I, I, I really do. Okay. Um, it really touches me. And it really shows that, you know, that I can have that kind of faith if I put my full trust in the Lord. Okay. And we need to come to this conclusion. We need to come to this grasp because we have not we have not known persecution here in this country. Oh, but it's coming. And it could be coming soon. Pastor Florescu and his son, an extraordinary story of Christian persecution. The following extraordinary story of Christian persecution is from the voice of the martyrs. Um, Pastor Florescu couldn't bear to watch his son being beaten by the communist officers. He had already been beaten himself, and he had not slept for two weeks. For fear of being attacked by the starving rats the communists had forced into his prison cell. The Romanian police wanted Florescu to give up other members of his underground church so that they too could be captured. Seeing that the beatings and torture weren't working, uh, and Pastor Florescu, because he wouldn't give them the information, the communists brought in Florescu's son, Alexander, only 14 years old, and began to beat the boy while Florescu watched. They hammered his son's body unmercifully, telling the pastor that they would beat his son to death unless he told them in the lo told them the locations of other believers. This is amazing, folks. Listen to this. Finally, half mad, Florescu screamed for them to stop. Alexander, the pastor says, I must say what they want. He called out to his son, I can't bear your beatings anymore. His body bruised, blood running from his nose and mouth. Alexander looked his father in the eye. This is amazing, folks. Father, don't do me the injustice of having a traitor as a parent. Stand strong. If they kill me, I will die with the word Jesus on my lips. This boy was 14 years old. And he had to comfort his father and tell him to stand strong. How are you going to be able to stand strong in the days of persecution? The boy's courage enraged the communist guards, and they beat him to death as his father watched. Not only did he told, uh, hold on to his faith, he helped his father do the same. See, that is what we're going to need in the days ahead. Because there's going to come a time, and your children might be involved, regardless of how old they are, five, six, seven. Eight. And when it comes to the point of, of you possibly being arrested and put into a camp and you have the choice of either taking the mark or dying, they, I'm sure they will use whatever means necessary. And if you have a boy that's like maybe five, seven, eight, they will use that tool to try to get you to take the mark. And are you going to give in? Or are you going to say, keep your eyes on Jesus, it's only going to hurt for a little while? That is what we have to understand. And that is what we have to be ready for, regardless if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture or not. These martyr stories really hold dear to my heart, okay? <clears throat> That's just like the Corey Ten Boom letter, letter I read you in the, um, the second or third video. So, okay. Continuing on, the doctrine of the rapture of the church is clearly taught in Scripture, okay? Um, and its meaning is inferred from the Greek word harpazo, translated or caught up um, in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. 
However, among premillennialists, those who readily believe that the second coming of Christ precedes his literal thousand-year reign on earth, Revelation 19.20, there are several opposing views concerning the, the timing of the rapture in relation to the Great Tribulation of Matthew 24.21-29, Daniel 12.1, Revelation 6-19, through 19, etc. Okay, the following arguments show that Contrary to the popular pre-tribulation rapture position, okay, the post-tribulation rapture, where the church will be on earth through the entire tribulation period, is the only position clearly taught in scripture, and which easily harmonizes with all passages dealing with the second coming of Christ. That is what I'm trying to focus on, okay? We have to look at basically the whole of the scriptures, and mainly the New Testament. Okay, and there's a lot in the Old Testament regarding the day of the Lord and everything like that. Okay, I know that I've had, you know, I have people throw scriptures at me and, you know, I try to do my best to explain those verses. How really, if you read the whole thing in context, it's not explaining that at all. And it really just boils down to reading maybe a verse down, you know, a verse lower and stuff like that and a lot of times they throw this stuff right out the window <clears throat> this is a warning from Ezekiel chapter 13 I'm going to start off by in verse 18 okay and say thus saith the Lord God woe to the women that sew pillows to, the, to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come into you? And will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread? To slay the souls that should not die? And serve the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies? Pillows is another euphemism of the word lies here in this context. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, I am against your lies. Wherewith you there hunt souls, hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go. Even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs, your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad. Whom I have, who I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Therefore you shall see no more vanity, nor divine divin divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I know a lot of post-tribulationists you know, like to use this verse to uh, really put fear into the pre-tribulation believers and I am not trying to do that folks um, I look at this when it says that uh, um, where it basically talks about you're making your lies your refuge and you're taking other people with them I am mainly using this verse to explain that if you have your full faith in this thing and if it turns out to be a lie, how many people would you have dragged into it by having them put their full faith in the event rather than the faith, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay. Second now, Second Timothy four one. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, the quick is the living, at his appearing and his kingdom. That's a key verse right there, as a matter of fact. I charge thee before therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Well, when is his appearing? On the last day, at the last trump. Okay. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, meaning the end times, 
when they will not endure sound doctrine. We sure see this being fulfilled today. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Doesn't this escapist doctrine seem like it, you know, it tickles your ear? It feels good because you don't like the idea of having to go through the tribulation. Okay, think about that for a moment, folks. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. That is what we need to do. We need to fight the good fight, we need to endure to the end, you, you have to finish the course, and you have to keep the faith, okay? I wanted to start off by using this word from Ezekiel first, and also this passage, which will occur again in this teaching, okay? Um, I want to take you real quick to Matthew 3.10, okay? And uh, we're going to read 10 through 12. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit. Okay, you remember how we talked about if this foundation of this teaching was based on good fruit. You know, from its, from its inception all the way to Darby and how it influenced the whole of the Western Church. Okay. Because you go to places like China, you go to places that are... People are constantly being persecuted that once possibly believed in the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. That doctrine is extinct. It, it, it doesn't exist. Okay. Now, I'm not asking you to throw out your doctrines or anything like that. But what I am asking is that you take that into consideration. Okay. We don't have it that bad here yet. Yeah, there's little things here and there. You know, like, for example, you got people being fined for having Bible studies in their homes in California. I mean, but they're not being persecuted. They're, they're not, you know, getting tortured. You know, I mean, I'm sure that's not the case for everything because, I mean, I'm sure there's people being secretly abducted and stuff like that and being tortured. And I'm not saying that. But as a grand scale throughout all of the Western Church, you don't have that here. You don't have that here. At least not yet. We don't have it this bad. We complain about this 501c3 status, which is the start. I mean, it's basically the coming together of the universal church. You know, with this 501c3 articles of incorporation. But that's it right now. <laughs> Wait till the stuff that, that's in that bill of 501c3 actually is getting enforced and for some of the parts it is as far as hate crimes homosexuality and stuff like that but <laughs> you ain't seen anything like these people have seen on the other side of the world so anyways now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire this is speaking of John the Baptist. John the Baptist speaking here. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan in his, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Okay. Now, what's it talking about purging his floor? Well... It's basically separating the tares from the wheat. Now you got to really look at that parable quick, you know, closely. And then you look at the whole thing about the flood, and the days of Noah, and the days of Lot. And look at that very closely. What's taken first? What's taken first? It's the tares. It's the tares. Okay, whose fan is in his hand. So a fan is basically, in, in, in this context, is a 
instrument for winnowing grain by moving which the grain is thrown up and agitated and the chaff is separated and blown away. So that's basically what it's saying here. A lot of times with these parables and stuff like that, um, he's using he's using farming and gardening for a lot of his explanations. Uh, speaking of Jesus and all throughout the Gospels, um, also you can take this to the five the the ten virgins. Okay, the ones that didn't have their lamp lit is basically the tares, the ones that wanted their ears tickled. It's not really talking about a rapture here, folks. That's not really what it's talking about. We'll get into that more here in another video, probably. Okay. Now, here's another one. Now, this this verse, so basically, that's basically the explanation. Is um, He purges his floor. The uh, wheat is basically sifted out with the fan with with the uh with the winnowing fan basically and um the uh tears are being separated or the chaff and it's blown away or it's uh burnt with unquenchable fire so that's the same thing how it's going to be between the elect of god the church and the jews alike jews there's no jew nor greek Everyone has to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Um, so, that's basically what that's describing. And there are tares among the wheat. So that means there are tares among the brethren. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. And quite possibly, those could be some of those wolves could be teaching you, you know, that pre-trip doctrine. Not saying, you know, this ain't coming against any of any any that are um, that truly love the Lord. But just remember that. Just remember that. But anyways, John eleven twenty three. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. This is a story of Martha. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Okay, this is probably going to be repeated here in a later video. But again, I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. If the dead in Christ rose first according to the pre-trip view, why did Martha respond to Jesus in this way? Okay, and why did Jesus not correct her if she said, she knew Lazarus would rise at the last day. Folks, the last day is the last day, meaning day of the Lord, or the last day prior to the millennium, which is associated to the day of the Lord, which is not the seven-year tribulation period. A lot of people like to associate the day of the Lord as, a, as the seven-year tribulation period. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it's not. Um... I have appointed you each day for a year. So the day of the Lord could actually be a full year event. But when it talks about the last day, it's talking about the last day. I mean, like the Battle of Armageddon, all that kind of stuff. So again, just be honest with yourselves and put away all that you were taught. And let's see what the scriptures plainly teach. But before we continue, I want to discuss briefly about the restrainer. A lot of people like to call this thing the restrainer, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Um, and um, this is very interesting, okay? And these verses are going to pop up again in another video. But I, I, I really wanted to uh, um, dissect these verses because something just wasn't sitting right without using these verses line upon line, interpreting Scripture with Scripture. So let's look at these. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.5 Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know that, that and now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work, or sin, or transgression of the law, um, lawlessness, um, 
only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Okay, this is where a lot of people are, are, are saying that this is the rapture right here. This is talking about the Holy Spirit. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, that wicked meaning the man of sin, the final end time ruler, dictator, or the Antichrist, um, even though there are many Antichrists in the world now, but this is like, the you know, the head honcho, the main guy, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, I also want to be crystal clear that even though that this man will be an end time dictator and he will be whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs of lying wonders, I want to be really clear that the false prophet and the end time leader, neither of them are human. Sure, if it's two individuals, you know, deceiving all these churches, that might be the case. But the thing is, they're not human. Okay, because every man, every every flesh and blood and bone body will be judged. Okay. Because the false prophet and the beast are both cast first alive into the lake of fire. This is before the millennial reign. Okay, so I just want to make, you, make that crystal clear. Every single person will stand before God, rather it's the white throne judgment or the second coming. Okay. Obviously, Second Thessalonians two nine. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and we sure see that a lot today. We really do, especially in these lukewarm, charismatic churches, um, UFO sightings, um, signs of Maitreya, crosses of light, things of that nature. Marian apparitions these are all lying wonders and I'm telling you right now and I want to make this crystal clear okay I know a lot of times these people think that everything is from God especially when it comes from healing when they go to these healing re revivals and things of that nature okay and and um you might have people come up to them, well, I got healed, so this has to be of God. And you look at these same people who are healing, and like I said, some of them do get healed. There are cases where they do get healed. Okay. <laughs> but the thing is, it's not of God. When you look at these mainstream churches. Because like I said, there are cases where people literally get healed. Um, I recently read a article back in the Lakeland Revival era with, with uh, Todd Bentley and um, this uh, one lady I guess had some kind of cancer or something like that or um, had real bad blood sugar or something like that you know just really in really bad shape okay and Todd Bentley healed her or laid hands on her and she was healed that there was medical proof. I mean, she went to the doctors. Everything was fine. I mean, like nothing ever happened. Perfectly healed. Okay. And obviously, hopefully, many of you are smart enough that to know that Todd Bentley is not of God. He's of his father, the devil. Okay. And of his works, he will do. So just because people do get healed in these circles and stuff like that, doesn't mean it's from God. Okay? So yes, healing is going to be part of that size and lying wonders. And I'm not saying God can't heal. He can. Okay? But, you know, when you give the devil an inch, he's going to take a mile. And the thing is, it really, it really depends on who you're putting your faith in. Are you putting your faith in just being healed? Or are you putting your faith in Jesus Christ to heal you? Are you putting your faith in the preacher? Or are you putting your faith into Jesus Christ? Okay. Sorry, I went down a little rabbit trail there. I do that quite a bit. Now, I want to say this first, and also this will be mentioned again later in this teaching. But this is not, and I repeat, not the removal of the church. And I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit, folks. 
The Holy Spirit just doesn't dwell in believers, but is in all the world. Remember, He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. Okay. It says before, it says, before I stand at the door and knock, if any man opens the door, I will come into him. Well, that implies that the Holy Spirit is also outside of that door, meaning the world. Okay. So again, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, let's see if we can come to some conclusion by looking at some other verses that may pertain to this subject. Okay. Now, again, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This is what a lot of, a lot of versions like to call the restrainer, a lot of people calling it the restrainer. Okay. Um, but I want to take you to Revelation 7. Okay. Chapter 1, 1 and 2. Um, and this is af this is before um they talk about the 144,000 1 through 3 Revelation chapter 7 And after these sayings I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea nor on any tree And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads now this is specifically talking about the hundred and forty four thousand okay so at this current time there are hundred and forty four thousand and I believe they are literal Jews because it does talk about what each tribe they come from, you know. And, I mean, if you want to turn this into a racial issue, you can if you want. But I'm not going to listen to it. You know, it says what it says in the scriptures, okay. Um, yes, I know some things have a spiritual meaning, but I don't think that this is the case. Okay. Um... <clears throat> But basically, what's going on here with these 144,000 is, is, is they are currently sealed and being sealed. Remember when, um, before Paul was Paul, he was Saul. He was basically a Pharisee, persecuted the Christians and everything. Um, he was like a chief of the Pharisees, basically. I mean, totally devoted to the law, the Mosaic law, the uh, Talmud, whatever else kind of traditions they had. And they basically had to unlearn everything. Okay. So it's kind of like the same thing. We right now probably have 144,000 Jews hidden away somewhere. Basically having to unlearn everything. Just being totally um, um, submitted to God. You know, getting ready for the end time ministry. Okay, where it talks about, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. That is the true revival. That is what's going to be happening. Not the revivals you see now. Okay. So. You can see like a starting point in this tribulation. Period. Now, this angel has some kind of charge over these four angels. And notice the word ascending. Okay, more on that in a moment. But I first wanted to clarify that this seal of God on the foreheads are in relation to the 144,000 Jews who will evangelize the world. Through the tribulation, seems like the emphasis is switching back to the Jews here more. Even though it's the whole world. I mean, you know, the Gentiles, the, the church also. Um... Probably because we Christians just weren't cutting it in any way, you know, cutting it, meaning, I mean, it's spreading a whole bunch of false doctrines out there and stuff like that. Anyway, notice the word ascension. And this one angel who has this charge over these four angels, okay? This one specific angel is the one that ascends, all right? So there's going to come a time where he's going to, you know, loose these four angels and basically relieve them of their duties so to speak alright now the word ascending means rising okay moving upwards 
proceeding from the less to the greater, proceeding from modern to ancient, from grave to more acute, a star is said to be ascending when rising above the horizon in any parallel of the of the equator. Okay. So basically, it basically means to rise, stand up, in a sense, rising. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this. Now, if you really want to hear a starting point of the tribulation by comparing scripture to scripture, let's look at Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the ch which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. Now notice he stands up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. And then, or basically, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book so this whole verse is basically discussing the whole tribulation from beginning to end okay now could it be possible that the actual restrainer is michael the archangel notice the word stand up okay which means ahmed ahmed which is a primitive root root to stand in various relations, literally and figuratively, um, intransitively and transitively, which means abide, appoint, arise, cease, confirm, continue, continue dwell, be employed, <laughs> endure, establish, leave, make, ordain, you know, that word leave, be, over, place, be, present, self, raise up, raise up, okay? Remain, repair, serve, set, forth, over, make to make, to be at a withstand. Th these are basically all explaining the phrase stand up. Now notice it said arise, cease, confirm, and continue. And also notice how it said um, leave also. Okay. It is almost strikingly similar as the word ascending. Now let's look at the passage in 2 Thessalonians again. Okay. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and know you not that withholdeth what he might be revealed in his time? That he might be revealed in his time? For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Again, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I know, you know, I mean, I still can't say for sure, but I think we can make a strong case that the restrainer is not actually the Holy Spirit or the church, but it could very well be Michael the Archangel keeping charge over the four angels of which is restraining the earth nor the sea to be, you know, to be hurt. Okay. I mean, think about it. He stands for the children of his people, Jews and the church, okay, or Gentile, whatever you want to say. And when I say Jews, I mean the one-third remnant that will be saved and the 144,000. Okay, you can read that in Zechariah 13, I think. And it only talks, I mean, two-thirds of the Jews, Jewish population is going to be destroyed. It's sad, but that's what it says. So, obviously, he must be here on earth in the spiritual realm. Remember, he is not omnipresent, so obviously at some time, he will stand up and ascend. Because soon he is going to lead God's army against Satan, Satan's forces. Keep in mind, you know, that's, I think that's in Revelation somewhere. I, I don't got really time to look it up now. But keep in mind when it speaks of that last trumpet and that great sound of an archangel which will lead a charge in gathering the elect from the four corners of the earth. So I can't say, you know, this is another, you know, this is basically my opinion. You know, I, I didn't really look into this portion of it. 
but I can't say for sure, but it almost seems like there are going to be angels gathering God's elect, and you are going to have Michael, along with Jesus Christ as King of Kings, coming down against these evil forces at the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, like I said, I'm not being dogmatic on that part, but I think it is interesting. Again, this portion that I just said, I'm not sure on. I just don't know, but we can make a strong case that it is Michael that is in charge of that wicked being revealed. So it is a strong possibility that um, him and these four angels are the restraining force behind that wicked being revealed. All right. Now, speaking of the trumpets and the tribulation, we start in Mark thirteen twenty four. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds. From the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now Jesus clearly said the trumpet will sound and the elect will be gathered immediately after the tribulation. That's what he said. Okay. Don't don't put your own spin on it. That's what he said. Matthew twenty four thirty one. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other okay preacher proponents must dismiss this passage by saying it does not refer to the rapture which it clearly does refer to the following arguments show that the event described in Matthew 24 31 is the rapture of the church the event in this passage being the rapture easily harmonizes with the other rapture passages like Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven we see that in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, remember we just talked about that, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with, hit with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Daniel 7.13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. And came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. <clears throat> Speaking of angels again, coming in the clouds of heaven. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Well, that just totally throws the, the kingdom now people out. And say, oh, we have to establish a kingdom on earth so it can be so good that Jesus Christ has to come back because we just did such a good job. Well, sorry, it's not going to work that way. Which, okay. So this sounds a whole lot like this seventh trumpet, the seventh last trumpet verse we previously read. Okay, and obviously in verse uh, Revelation eleven fifteen, and the seventh angel sounded it, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Remember like the whole Chuck Missler thing? He was saying, oh, this is like talking about trumpets like during the millennium and stuff like that. I, I mean, you read some of the stuff and you just got to like really... I mean, if you want to believe it, believe it, but it's not biblical, what he was saying. Matthew twenty four thirty one. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. I already read that. Okay. The event in this passage being the rapture also easily harmonizes again with the other rapture passages. All right, and uh, so, like, 
heralded by sound of a great trumpet. So 1 Thessalonians 4.16, now we're going to look at this trumpet. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Corinthians 15.52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This isn't talking about the Feast of Trumpets. This isn't talking about the the um, 90 blast, the, the first trumpet, you know, raising the dead, and the last trumpet being the rapture. That's not what it's talking about, folks. As a matter of fact, that's not even in the Bible. That's from rabbis. That's from uh, rabbis' writings, rabbinical uh, literature. It's not in the Bible. Oh, well, it's Jews, so they have to be right because they're God's chosen people. Well, you know what? If you want to believe and trust in man, then that's that's your prerogative, okay? <laughs> remember what I, you know, remember the passages in the beginning in Proverbs. I mean, if you want... He, you know, <laughs> Like I said, if, if if you want to trust in man's teachings, regardless if they're Jews or not, therefore, you know, do what you want. But it's very dangerous. I'm telling you right now. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart dis departeth from the Lord. So if you're going to want to put your full trust in the Jews, because they have all this literature and they have all this knowledge then you're essentially putting a curse on yourselves because you're not supposed to be trusting in man okay that's what the Jews are they are men they are they they are men okay so throw that out again these are strongholds we have to overcome here alright and I, I know I'm being harsh right now but and I'm not cursing Israel, I'm not cursing the Jews, I'm not being a Jew hater. No, that's just strictly what the scriptures say. Period. That's what it says. Anyway, and again in Revelation eleven fifteen, and the seventh angel sounded it sounded, and there was there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Um, and again, we're going to read Matthew twenty four thirty one. I'm, I I I really want to put these verses in your heads. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, the event in this passage, being the rapture, also easily harmonizes with the other rapture passages, like accompanied by the angels. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, we see the voice of archangel, voice of an archangel. In 2 Thessalonians 1.7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The clouds of heaven. That's it's basically another reference to angels. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.8, And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? <clears throat> so, again, we're, we're, we're seeing the term angels here. So, who is really gathering the elect? It's not Jesus Christ. It's the angels. Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 1.10 when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Second Thessalonians 2 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit or by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So again, we're, we're seeing this gathering together and everything like that. 
Now, the plain sense interpretation, an obvious point of this passage was meant to dispel a false alarm at Thessalonica. It deals with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and are gathering together unto him and will not occur until after the falling away. Okay? Which means apostasy. Okay? Um, now, when you look at places in Scripture where it talks about the thief in the night, in First Thessalonians, I think it is, um, again, you have to read that in context. Okay? Paul was basically speaking to them at this at that point of time and they were prepared to go through the tribulation to go through all the stuff to be grounded on in, in the word of God and you know they were preparing them for that so that day would not overcome them as a thief in the night okay it's not talking about the seven year tribulation okay it's the same thing with us. We need to continually contend for the faith, continually be grounded in the solid rock, okay? Continue to be in his word so that that day will not overcome and overtake us like a thief. You want to know what those five foolish, foolish virgins are? Those are the ones that weren't in faith, that didn't have their faith grounded at the rock, you know, even though they might have been Christian or whatever. Their lamps were low, the oil was low, and it's not talking about a rapture. It's talking about, was their faith grounded basically on the solid rock of Jesus Christ? And did that day overcome and take them like a thief in the night? That's what it's basically saying. It's not really referencing a pre-tribulation rapture. But anyway... The plain sense interpretation, an obvious point of this passage, was meant to dispel a false alarm at Thessalonica. It deals with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, and will not occur until after the falling away. And the Antichrist is revealed. <clears throat> now, in the falling away in verse 3 is the word apostasia, meaning rebellion, okay? Uh, 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit, now the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Again, this is what the falling away means, apostasia, Okay. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And boy, do we see that going on right now. Very scary thought. Okay. We can see this in Matthew 24.10. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Okay. This is the falling away. This isn't the rapture of the church. So, departure from earth rather than from the faith. As claimed by many pre-trip proponents. Uh, is totally contrary to the clear meaning of the Greek word apostasia. Which means rebellion and anarchy and not a catching away of the saints. Uh, Proverbs 13.13 13, now remember, um, it's 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 kind of interesting that uh, um, uh, number the number thirteen is the number of rebellion, and I want to take you to Proverbs thirteen thirteen. And this is another example of this. Um, I want to pull up Esau because I'm gonna. <laughs> I I mean I kind of messed up that. But uh, Proverbs thirteen thirteen. And, re and rebellion is also as of the sin of witchcraft. So keep that in mind too. Proverbs thirteen thirteen. Whoso despiseth the word, Jesus Christ, Jesus is the word. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. 
Isn't that funny that the number 13 is the number of rebellion? And it's talking about despising the word. <laughs> a little food for thought there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end part 5. And hopefully I can continue on part 6 tomorrow. Um, uh, and like I said, a after all of these are done, I'm going to try and put these in CD format. Along with my other Marines Way teachings. And the ones coming here in the near future. So, um... Again, folks, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe, God bless, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.